clearly, that's for sure, but you look at it and you understand a little more. It goes on, it says, for example, in the context of litigation over U.S. federal taxation, the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit has stated, a petition to the tax court or tax return, isn't that interesting? Now, that's something I didn't pick up the first time. Good God. A petition to the tax court or a tax return, I don't know that they're saying that a petition to a tax court is the same as a tax return, apparently they're using these two different states, is frivolous if it is contrary to established law and unsupported by reasoned, colorable argument for change in the law. Okay? Now, this established law, what law is established? Especially when we are running in a territorial jurisdiction and territorial courts and we are probably not in judicial courts, what law is established when we have a United States, what is it, government of the United States, and we can find this on Manda.com, which is identified as a private company that was started in 1787, two years before the Constitution was ratified by the people of the United States of America. What the hell is the established law for this private corporation, private company? Is that established law? What are we talking about here? I mean, the whole thing just becomes bizarre, but you look, you read, you make sense, you try to make sense, and at least you learn how to advance arguments. This is the standard applied under Rule 11 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure for sanctions in civil litigation and the standard we have used for the award of fees under blah, 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 blah. All right. You've got it's frivolous if it's contrary to established law. You've got to show, first off, that your argument, your defense, that your defense or your claim is not contrary to established law. That's point one, and you have to back it up then by an argument. Let me proceed through here. Here's another one. Attorney Daniel Evans writes, When a judge calls an argument ridiculous or frivolous, it is absolutely the worst thing the judge could say. It means that the person arguing the position has absolutely no idea of what he is doing and has completely wasted everyone's time. It doesn't mean that the case wasn't well argued or that the judge simply decided for the other side. It means that there was no other side. Now, that's important right there. That gives us some insight. The argument was absolutely positively incompetent. The author implies that when he says something is incompetent, it means there is no other side. We're given some clues here. This is part of the reason I like Wikipedia. It will teach you things if you can read closely. The judge is not telling you that you are wrong. The judge is telling you that you are out of your mind. Now, here's some comments from me on this. If a frivolous claim or defense is one presented without an argument, then it follows that the other side has not denied or argued against the particular claim or defense. You get that? One of the points they're making relative to frivolous is it's got to be backed up. If it's not, if you don't have a law that clearly backs you up or what they call established law, and God knows what that is exactly, if you are violating what they think is established law, you're going to have a, you're going to be slapped with this label of frivolous unless you back it up with an argument. Now, suppose you don't back it up with an argument, and particularly suppose it's a defense. If there's no argument, what have you got here? I think they're giving us a clue that may help to understand the concept of frivolous a little better. I think what they're telling us, what they're at least implying, is that your defense is, in the opinion of the judge, irrelevant to the plaintiff's claim. The plaintiff says you owe $20,000 in back income taxes. That would be the IRS. And you're arguing, I am a sovereign. I have all my God-given unalienable rights, and you can't lay a glove on me. In this circumstance, the court would be correct if they said your argument was frivolous. The question whether you're sovereign or not does not go to whether or not you owe money. Your defense has got to directly relate to the plaintiff's claim. If you're coming up with some defense that's off on the side, you have not adequately addressed the plaintiff's claim. One of the things we've talked about on this program in the past is the idea that, first off, money was, up until, say, 50 years ago, and probably even later than that, on up into the 70s, 
Money was defined as a unit of value, but it is today defined as a unit of account. And that distinction has led me to suspect that most of what takes place in our courtrooms may be actions of account. We've talked about it on the program in the past. And if that were true, the judge's only business when you go to court is to balance the account. Right? The whole issue is if you're the debtor, we got an account, the, balance, the account has not been balanced, we have to balance the account. I'm not saying this is true, I'm saying this is possible. If that were, if it were an action of account, if that's what's really going on, you strip away all the window dressing, the rest of it, all we got is an account, the plaintiff says you owe $50,000, and you are trying to skate off the hook by saying I'm a sovereign. Well, the only issue in an action of account, there are two issues, maybe three. One, is there an account? If they say you owe fifty grand and you don't deny that there's an account, guess what? It will be presumed there is an account. And if next point is if there is an account, are you the debtor in that account? And if you aren't specifically denying that you have entered into a debtor creditor relationship with the plaintiff, it's gonna be presumed you're the debtor. Now we got an account that the plaintiff says fifty thousand and says there's an account for fifty thousand dollars and they say you are the debtor and you have not denied any of it. You're quibbling, you're over there saying, I have reserved my rights, baby. That's right. I got it all here. I've reserved my rights. And say, no, no. If you got an account and you're the debtor, number two, and number three, is there a fiduciary in this account? And I suspect the fiduciary would have to be you. And if there is, the account will be adjudicated in equity. If there were no fiduciary, they'd have to take the account to law. That's the implication. Can't tell you it's God's truth, but I think that's the case. Uh, in, well, where are we going with this? We're going with the idea that if you don't properly understand the basis, the real basis, not just the IRS says you owe 50 grand, you've got to go deeper than that. You've got to find out what is the real nature of this claim that's being made against me. And if it turned out that it was an action of account, then your first order of business is to deny the existence of the account. Make them prove it. And then make them prove that you have voluntarily entered into that account as a debtor. And then make them prove that you have voluntarily agreed to serve as a fiduciary on that account. Now, if you're over standing in the corner waving the flag and the Bible and telling people about your God-given unalienable rights, the judge will correctly declare that your arguments are frivolous. You're not addressing the real issue, which is, is there an account? Are you the debtor? Are you a fiduciary? If you are, they can hear this thing in equity. If not, if you could defeat any of those fundamental issues, I think you would stop an action of account. Now, I'm not positive by any stretch of the imagination that that's what's really going on in their courts. But we've talked about it in the past, and I think it could be. I think there's a high probability that it's happening in a lot of instances, and maybe a majority of instances, but I don't have evidence to support that. The point I'm trying to make is that the court is correct. With this concept of frivolous, if, they are, if you are advancing defenses, for example, do not, that do not directly challenge your adversary's claim. If you're not directly challenging the basis of his claim, yeah, it's frivolous. The whole thing is, the only thing the judge is asked to do in an action of account is balance the account. If you owe 50, judge is there to say, pay the 50. End of story. It's that simple. Don't give, me any, don't give me any constitutional nonsense. Pay the 50. Now, the point is that you are bamboozled because then you are relying on constitutional defenses because you haven't, you and I, have not properly discerned the true nature of the claim that's being made against us. We have not properly identified the foundation of the duty that you and I, as defendants, are alleged to have breached. And as we talked about this earlier this week, when you go to court, it's not a question of your rights, it's a question of your duties. If you're there as a defendant, the whole idea is that you've breached some duty. If you want to stop the suit, you've got to astutely identify the ground that the plaintiff has for claiming that you have a duty to him, to the plaintiff. You're a person obligated to pay. You are duty bound to do this. You haven't, you, you haven't fulfilled your duty. The judge is going to make you perform your duty. It's that simple. The only defense on this is that you are not the person with this duty. That's basically what it comes down to. You go down and say, no, I don't have a duty to him. Mm -hmm. I don't have a duty to him. 
I didn't voluntarily assume that. I certainly didn't voluntarily agree to be a fiduciary. Deny. You've got to learn to identify the duty. It ain't about the rights, but the duty. Identify that and then take it apart. If you are adequately attacking that duty, there is a strong probability that you might be able to evade being labeled frivolous. If you do not directly attack the grounds for the alleged duty, chances are you're not going to have a very happy conclusion at that trial. Odds are you're going to be found guilty. Right? And on one level, rightfully so. 